So let's talk about plosives. Plosives are actually highly complex in terms of production. They are sounds that really change over the course of production. Um, plosives are aperiodic. They do change over the course of production. Plosives are marked acoustically by a transient burst of noise. So plosives, p, b, t, d, k, g. There's a transient burst of noise, and that burst is shorter in duration than fricative turbulence. So you could hear, um, even if you heard just a little bit of that burst of noise and a little bit of that fricative turbulence, maybe you could only hear the low frequency tail end of the burst of noise in a plosive and the low frequency tail end of the turbulence in a fricative, you'd know that they were different because the burst of noise in a plosive is much quicker, shorter in duration, compared to the um, turbulence in a fricative. Plosives can be voiced or voiceless. Now, there are stages in production. There are sequential stages in the production of a plosive. Because this is an explosion of sound, we first have to have a buildup of air pressure. So there's an occlusion along the vocal tract. Let's just think about um, a buh. I'm going to close my lips together, build up air pressure, and during that period of time that I'm building up air pressure, I'm going to change my production to a puh. So I have the lips together for the puh, and during that time that I'm closing, the, that I have the lips closed, and I'm building up pressure, there's a little bit of silence. When we look at the spectrogram, we're going to see what we call the silent gap. And then there's a buildup until suddenly there's an explosive release of air pressure, which is the plosive, and that burst of, of air pressure is a noise burst, and it's seen as a vertical, generally high-frequency spike, but it can be fairly broadband. That spike can actually range from about 500 to 4,000 hertz, depending upon the particular consonant. And then another important aspect of plosives is that transition into the vowel, from the vowel into the plosive, or in particular, out of the plosive into the vowel. And in particular, that second formant transition is important to perception. So let's take the same information and reconfigure it into perceptual cues for manner, place, and voicing. Again, in manner, one important cue is that something is happening sequentially. We have this followed by this followed by this. We have the silent period in the occlusion K stage, and then we have that transient noise burst that ranges from about 500 to 4,000 hertz. Place of consonant production, be it labial, b, alveolar, labial, p, b, alveolar, t, d, or velar, k, g, is signaled by the second format transition, generally from the consonant into the vowel. And that F2 ranges from about 1,000 to 3,000 hertz, depending upon the consonant and the vowel context. In general, what we see in Dr. Ling's information and in other information is that it's really important to be able to hear at least through 2,000 hertz with one's hearing aids. Um, certainly, it's available through the cochlear implant. If you can hear through 2,000 hertz, you can make many of the constant place distinctions for plosives. What's essential to know is just how much F2 varies with vowel context. So there's no single second formant transition frequency range for the duh and the tuh for the alveolar place. There's no single 
F2 CV transition for the velar cut and go. There's no single F2 transition range for the labial. Um, there's actually some evidence that it's two pieces of frequency information, the start and the end of the formant transition, and I've put some references in the reference list for some research that looks at this two piece of information perceptual process called locus theory and locus equations, but that's beyond our conversation. We just want to apply this stuff to audiograms right now. Second formant transition is important to perception. Hearing a place, hearing through at least 2000 hertz is important to perceiving different places of constant production, um, although a, a plos constant plosive production, although it would be really nice to be able to hear through 3000 hertz. Now voicing. Voicing is kind of complex in plosives. In voice plosives, if you remember that quote silent stage, that occlusion stage, and we'll see this on the on the spectrogram, in that occlusion stage we have something called a voice bar. So even though it's supposed to be a silent stage, there's actually the vocal folds are still vibrating a little bit because they're generating some sound. You can see it on the spectrogram. You, listeners can identify it in when you segment out portions of plosive production. So the presence of that voice bar during that occlusion stage, very faint fundamental frequency present, signals the voiced consonant ba, da, ga. Now there's another important signal, and that is something called voice onset time. And again, we'll see this on the spectrograms, I'll go over it again. I just want to give you the verbal stuff first. Um, so the time from that noise burst to when the vowel begins um, is, is called the voice onset time. It follows that silent period. It's right after the noise burst, and it's shorter in voiceless plosives compared to voiced. And we'll look at it to make it seem more real for you. So here are the syllables, a pam, a tan, a kang. We've seen these syllables before, but now I've segmented out the plosives, the voiceless plosives. Here's the silent gap for the p. So it looks like we don't see any sound right here. And what's happening is that as the lips are closed to create that consonant, we have a buildup of air pressure and no sound coming through. Similar, we have this silent gap here for the t as sound is being blocked and airflow is being built up before the release of the t. And likewise for the k. It's our silent period. And these are voiceless plosives, so we don't see that voice bar that I was talking about. Just this silent gap. Now following this silent buildup of air pressure, we have this burst of noise. And so here's the burst of noise, very quick for the p. You see it extends all the way down from maybe about, gosh, even maybe about 300 hertz, all the way on this scale to about 4,000 hertz. Here's that noise spike here for the t, for the explosion of sound. And here's the noise spike here, that burst of noise, that explosion. Very short for the k, and broad band extends across quite the frequency range. So we think about p, t, and k as being very soft and high frequency. But there's some low frequency information here that's not going to give the listener everything they need to identify these consonants, but there's a little bit of something there. So again, while a youngster is waiting for a cochlear implant, maybe they're just hearing the low frequencies, we can still start to develop those neural connections.
between sound and language. Let's continue to look at this. We have here, we're going to look at the format transitions. So I've moved over th to the a tan just to be able to um, show you the transitions without getting interference with the other things that we've labeled on the spectrogram. So here we have our explosion of sound for the, for the plosive t. And then we have the movement from that explosion into the valve, the third formant, the second formant, and the first formant. It's, it's fainter. We have the formant transitions here, here, third, second, and first for the p. And if I move over here to the k, here's my third formant. Probably my second formant is coming down here. The transition from that burst of noise into the um, valve. And the first formant transition is not as apparent. And it's actually because this is a voiceless plosive. Now, voice onset time. I had said that voicelessness is indicated um, by the presence or the absence of a voice bar during this silent period. And we don't see a voice bar because these are... These are um, voiceless plosives, and we'll see the voice bar in, in the next slide. But look at this timing between the explosion, the noise spike, and the actual onset of the valve. And I'm saying the onset of the valve being where the valve becomes steady state, not the transition. That, that If we just segment out the transition, listeners will say they hear both the consonant and the vowel. But where the vowel becomes steady state, we have this period of time. Over here, where the vowel becomes steady state, we have this period of time. And then for the p, we have this period of time. We're going to see this in the voiced cognates here. Here is the... Um, a bab, a dad, a gag, and we have the silent period, and for the buh, the noise spike isn't quite as easily seen. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why buh and ma are, are sometimes um, confused by listeners because that noise spike isn't quite as apparent in production. But let's look at a dad. We have the noise spike, a silent period, the noise spike, and it, we get into the vowel pretty quickly. A gag, silent period, noise spike, and then the transition into the vowel. Now let's compare and contrast um, voiced and voiceless plosives. Here is the voiceless a tan and here is the voiced a dad. Voiceless t and voiced d. And the distance, the duration, the timing between the noise spike and the appearance of the vowel sound is longer for the t, the t compared to the duration, the amount of time between the noise spike and the onset of the vowel for the duh. So the ability to hear the onset of a vowel gives the listener information about whether or not a consonant is voiced or voiceless. It's not just listening to the fundamental frequency, but it's also that listening for voice onset time. And that's a timing perceptual activity that's not necessarily reflected on the audiogram, but important for us to think about. Now, if you look on the bottom of this spectrogram, I've added the voice bar. And I'm going to remove the um, arrow for just a moment, and I'm going to take my 
um, cursor. And I'm just going to kind of tease here on the duh. And this little portion right down here is actually fundamental frequency. Right down here on the spectrogram. And so I've got it pinpointed. I've got it highlighted with this arrow. And that's the voice bar during the silent period. Voice bar during the silent period indicates a voiced plosive and a shorter voice onset time compared to the voiceless onset time, voice onset time. Shorter for voiced, longer for voiceless consonants. Now, I had mentioned that the F2 transition is really impacted by context and hard to, difficult to predict in terms of what the frequency of the F2 transition is. Um, and I'm just bringing this graph up, this, this display up, to show you a classic piece of research where in the early days when researchers were looking at speech acoustics and they were trying to get this, this um, invariant, unchanging number that's going to tell you in terms of frequency or the shape of the second form transition, how you're going to know what place of articulation is for plosives. And what the researchers found, that this, this is just like a cartoon of a spectrogram. So here's second formant transition, the vowel, second formant transition for the vowel, taken out of um, plosive plus vowel production. And what you see is that depending on the vowel that's connected to the consonant, the, um, the little... CV transition, sometimes it starts low and goes up, starts low and goes up, and it starts lower depending upon what the vowel is. Um, but if you look at the D and the B, um, this transition is not real different for the D versus the B. So there's there, so just hanging a number on F2 transition is insufficient if we're looking for just a number to put on an audiogram to tell us exactly um, what place of plosive production is. We're going to give kind of a range of number. You need to hear at least through 2000 hertz to hear that second formant transition. Although if you look at this graph, the second formant transition is appearing above 2,000 hertz. It's getting closer to 3,000 hertz. So it's going to vary from listener and from speaker to speaker. Got to hear the high frequencies to hear place of constant production for plosives. But there's no one specific number that's going to satisfy you. Affricates. In English, we really only have two affricates, the ch and the j. And they're the voiced voiceless cognates, meaning that they have the same manner of production, affricate, and they have the same place of production, um, alveolar or palatal alveolar. Sa affricates are aperiodic. They change over the course of production, and they are really a combination of a plosive plus a fricative, so there's a transient burst of noise followed by steady state turbulence or frication. They can be voiced or voiceless. Now because affricates are the um, combination of first a plosive followed by a fricative, we have these stages of production sort of the way we had stages of production for plosives. You have an occlusion of the vocal tract with a buildup of air pressure and a silent gap. And then you have this explosive release of air pressure in this noise burst. The noise burst for affricates ranges from 2,000 to 4,000 hertz in general. And then followed by a turbulent noise, this frication, that ranges from 2,000 to 8,000 hertz. Let's just look at the spectrograms.
I'm sorry, let's look at the perceptual cues. So I'm taking the same information and moving it into cues for manner, um, place, and voicing. But keep in mind that the place is the same for both of these um, for, for both of these sounds. So the manner is sequential. You've got the silent period. You have the transient burst of noise that's higher than implo for affricates than plosives. You have the turbulence that is um, ranges from 2,000 to 8,000 hertz, and that turbulent that turbulent frication is actually shorter in duration than in fricatives. So how I know I've got an affricate is I've got silent period, that transient explosion of noise. I know it's not really a plosive because it's followed by this turbulence, and the transient noise burst is a little higher in affricates than in plosives, and it's a little sh and the turbulence is a little shorter in in affricates than in fricatives. I'm going to drop down to talking about voicing during the occlusion stage in the voiced affricate ja. You see that little voice bar fundamental frequency is present during that, quote, silent occlusion stage. And it's also present in the turbulent portion of frication. Let's look at a picture of these consonants to help you understand a little bit better. And I'm showing you yet another way that we look at, at spectrograms in color. This word is church. So we have the affricate ch, er, ch. So here um, we have a noise burst for the initial ch, followed by turbulence. Here's the vowel. And then we have a silent gap between the vowel and the ch in church, followed by the noise burst and the turbulence. Now you may be seeing these markings here and thinking, oh gosh, is that a noise burst? And it's not, it's actually a little bit of a, a glottal stop as we're moving from church. -er There's a little bit of glottal performance there. So noise burst followed by turbulent for the affricate. Silent gap that's more apparent for this affricate. It wasn't so apparent here because of the way the recording was made. Silent gap, noise burst, followed by turbulence. Let's pull all this together on a big old chart of audiometric frequencies. Let's try to get something we can hang our hats on here. So, so far, Prior to this lecture, we've talked about seg supersegmentals and the vowels, and supersegmentals are um, signaled by fundamental frequency at an average of 250 hertz, and supersegmentals um, signal our, our, our duration, intonation, syllable number, and stress. The vowels are um, indicated by first and second formants, and we've, we've talked about the frequency ranges of F1 and F2. Now let's look at liquids and glides. Liquids and glides are voiced, so there's fundamental frequency at 250 hertz. In general, because they are fast-changing formants, the first formant in liquids and glides is around 500 hertz. The second formant, around 1,000 hertz. And then for ra and la, the third formant is important for differentiating those sounds and identifying those sounds. And the third formant in these consonants is around 2,000 hertz. Nasals. Nasals are characterized by a nasal murmur that is really a broad extension from, from fundamental frequency um, 
to just above fundamental frequency. So we're going to say it's centered around 250 hertz. Now the F2 transition in and out of a nasal, even though it's fairly weak, gives us some information about place of articulation for nasals. And it's around 1000 hertz. Again, we're going to general make a general statement about frequency but does change from speaker to speaker plosives some plosives are voiced signaled by fundamental frequency present in the voice bar during the silent period plosives are characterized by this burst of noise brief explosion of noise that ranges from 500 hertz all the way through 4,000 hertz. So for each of these audiometric frequencies, I've indicated that the noise burst can be present. Consonant place of articulation for plosives is signaled by the second formant transition either into or out of the vowel surrounding that plosive and that information is is found predominantly in uh, from a thousand hertz to two thousand hertz can extend into three thousand hertz but we don't have three thousand hertz listed on this chart fricatives some fricatives can be voiced at 250 hertz and here, with regard to place of articulation, we're going to talk about where the primary turbulence is. Fricatives are indicated by this turbulent energy, and that turbulence extends from 1,000 hertz all the way down to 8,000 hertz. And the primary turbulence for the farthest back fricative, the H, is around that a thousand hertz for the sh and the z two thousand hertz for s and z four thousand hertz for the f v and the voiced and voiceless th at six thousand hertz and there's even turbulent energy at eight thousand hertz and this listing is slightly different from what you see in Ling where he's put um, th energy down. Um, I think it's down here at 2,000 hertz. The affricates, some are voiced, so you've got the voice bar, fundamental frequency um, appearing in that occlusion phase at around 250 hertz, but keeping in mind that, um, that it's very brief. You have the noise burst at a ranging from 2,000 through 4,000 hertz. So I had said that the noise burst for affricates is higher than for um, plosives. You'll see the noise burst for plosives can range from 500 through 4,000 hertz. The noise burst for affricates can range from 2,000 through 4,000 hertz, and that noise burst is then followed by frication, by turbulence. And that turbulence is also higher in frequency for affricates compared to fricatives, ranging from 2,000 all the way up through 8,000 hertz. We're going to take this information in the next lecture and pull it together Look at it on the audiogram. Look at audiograms that have speech sounds plotted on them, some very, very commonly appearing audiograms, and ferret out why different speech sounds are plotted in certain ways on the audiogram. We'll also look at additional ways that we can determine audibility from information about listening with the hearing aid of the cochlear implant. And we'll also talk about the application of speech acoustics to the Ling-6 sound test. Again, if you would like a copy of these slides, you can go to this Dropbox address. You can write to me at HelenMcMorrison at gmail.com.
And if you're interested in learning more about strategies with, for working with children with hearing loss and their families, go to RecipeSLP.com for an upcoming series of short evidence-based ebooks that cover strategies for working with children and families. Thank you for sticking with me with the hairy topic of consonant acoustics. And I look forward to your comments and your questions and your feedback. Thank you.